I'm from western North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm a deer hunter, and that's where I had my encounter with the big gun on the afternoon of December. Three deer had run out of the thicket through the bottom and up the ridge past me. When? I say running. I mean they were running for their lives. I could tell they weren't running from a rutting buck, but I got ready anyway. About 15 minutes later, I hadn't seen anything else, and it was pretty dark by then. I then spotted something on the edge of the pond, and it was big. I looked through my scope, but I couldn't see anything. I lowered the gun, and I'd see movement again. I know I was looking at the right spot. It's pretty dark by now, so I started packing everything up, and I was about 35 feet high in a popular tree in a climbing stand, so it took about five minutes to get to the ground. Once I got to the ground, it was black in the woods. I started shaking my stand off the tree, and that's when I heard a scream, the loudest thing I've ever heard in my 32 years. This scream started out high and ended up as a low, growling sound. I would say it lasted maybe four to six seconds. I hit the ground and cut off my light. I could hear it walking on two legs in the creek bottom. It was super thick down there, and man could not walk through it in the dark without a light. It sounded like it was coming up the ridge toward me, and I had to do something. I ripped around into a big oak tree close to me. When I did, it took off and ran back through the creek bottom and into the pines like its butt was on fire. I got my stand and got the hell out. Two days later, I took a friend back in there with me to look at the limbs it broke while running. It was on white oak limbs three inches thick and was broken off six feet high off of the ground. The mountain laurel bushes were mowed down. It was a sight to see. It was during a five, six day long backpacking trip I did with the Boy Scouts in the Sierras. We were a few days in and stopped at a big lake. While we were setting up camp, some older looking dude, probably early to late forties, and a girl, 1920, the way they showed up and started setting up their camp as well. While the boys and I were fishing, we overhear our scoutmaster talking to the two individuals about smellables, foods and stuff that attract bears as they seem to be pretty unaware, is what counts as a smellable. The next day we got up early and broke down camp and made our way to the top of some mountain. While we were setting up camp at the end of the day, our scoutmaster got kind of worried because the other two backpackers never showed up or passed us. At the end of the trip we stopped at the ranger station and our scoutmaster asked about the duo. The ranger said there weren't any people matching their description in the books. We were kind of weirded out by this and concluded that what we saw were the ghosts of two backpackers that got mauled by a bear and was a great story to tell the new scouts for a while. On Wednesday, October 12, 2005, our neighbor's dogs were very active, barking throughout the night. The next morning, around 5.30 a.m., my own dog was barking in the backyard. I opened the door to calm her down and heard something at the back of our property near the fruit trees. It produced a heavy sound, and I could hear branches breaking as it departed. The following morning at around 8.30, my husband went to his truck in the backyard and heard something behind our shop take off running. Initially, he thought it was a hunter and rushed to the back to listen. He described the sound as if it were on two feet, noting that it was Tom running heavily through the woods, accompanied by snorting. On Sunday, October 16th, I went for a walk around the neighborhood road and discovered several sets of large and small bare footprints on the gray slate road in front of our house. Initially mistaking one set for a child's footprint, a closer inspection revealed two sets. The largest measured 13 and a half by 7 inches, while the smaller print measured 9 by 4 inches. I took pictures of all the prints and measured each one consistently finding the same size. 
The large print was about three inches wider than my husband's foot, and he's a rather big man. Several friends and I had pooled our resources to purchase 120 acres of cute over forest land, completely surrounded by several thousand acres of timber company land. This piece of land was situated at the end of a small valley and at the far end of a dead-end road. On my portion of the land, there was a small rise in the northern half of the valley, and I was in the process of building a shack for hunting and camping. One night, around 8 p.m., while working inside with the light from my lantern, I decided to step outside on the deck for a cigarette. As soon as I lit my lighter, a roaring, crackling scream emanated from the slope of the ridge to the south, approximately 300 yards away, but directly in my line of sight. I was too startled to do anything but stay rooted to the spot, feeling the hair stand up on the back of my neck, something that hadn't happened to me in years. Although the scream lasted only a couple of seconds, it seemed to go on for a very long time. Due to the cloudy and dark conditions, I ran inside for a flashlight, all the while wishing I had brought my rifle inside from the truck. With a flashlight and a hatchet, I headed for the truck, only to find that the truck itself seemed to be moving. In the bed of the truck, I discovered my German shepherd, whom I had forgotten about, curled in a tight ball in the corner and shaking so hard that he was moving the whole truck. We left immediately. Several nights later, one of the friends who had initially laughed at me when I told the story came out to see how I was progressing with the shack. He laughed even more at the extra lanterns I had placed inside and outside, as well as the pistol and shotgun lying on the table. When we stepped out onto the lit deck almost immediately, the same grating scream came from exactly the same spot on the south ridge. In a flash, my friend stood back, too, back with me as we stared out into the dark. Since the dog was not with us, and because we were armed and had good flashlights, we stayed there for about two more hours, but heard nothing else. I was certainly glad to have a witness this time. Several weeks later, my friend and I encountered another property owner and were sharing this story with him. I noticed him becoming a bit pale, and he finally told us that he had been burning piles of deadfall on his part of the property that abuts the south ridge. While walking back and forth to the stream to get water to put out several fires, he heard something walking around him in the woods. Initially assuming it was a deer or maybe a bear after listening for a while, he decided it sounded like a two-legged creature. Believing it was one of us trying to play a joke on him, he continued putting out his fires while listening to whatever it was making a circle around him. However, when it moved away from him, he began to smell a terrible odor that scared him so badly he got in his truck and left, ignoring his still smoldering fire. I cannot say what it was that we heard or what the other man had smelled, but I have heard several kinds of big cats, bears, howler monkeys, and other large animals in my years of hunting and, and in the army, and I have never heard anything that sounded remotely like what was heard on those two nights. I recently watched your video on YouTube about the men in black. Back around 2018, my mother and I were riding along a two-lane country road in Leon County, Florida. It was an older road where the lane dividers had all but faded and just large enough to let cars pass each other without getting into a wreck. There was a lot of overgrowth and trees with moss on each side of the road. As we drove, we passed a clearing where you could see a large barbed wire fence and a small runway for an airplane. There was a black car parked with two men in the front seats, sitting perfectly still. They both wore black suits, ties, and brimmed hats. As we passed and stared, they did not move an inch. A few moments later, as we were driving along down the road, their car suddenly appeared behind us. It startled both of us because we were watching for anything weird after passing them. 
after that, I don't remember anything else. I've tried to talk to my mother, but she gets teary. Iden says she doesn't remember what happened after they popped up behind us. The second incident occurred when I was older and had my first apartment. I had gotten a puppy and was still trying to house. Train her every night around 2 a.m. She would wake up and cry to go outside. I normally got up and took the trash down to the bin as I walked the puppy. For whatever reason, this night she didn't wake me up at around 3 a.m. I woke up to the sound of someone knocking on my door. After checking the peephole and opening the door, I decided to ignore it. Fifteen minutes later, the puppy was barking to go out. I got up, grabbed the trash, and took her outside with me. As we got to the dumpster, I saw the same car with two guys sitting in it as before on the country road. Because of the knocking on the door, I grabbed my pistol and tucked it into my shorts. As soon as I made eye contact with one of them, they began to get out of the car. I dropped the trash bag, picked up the puppy, and started to backpack to the apartment slowly. They both got out of the car and started walking towards me. As I started to grab my pistol with my free hand, they both stopped moving entirely. They didn't even blink. We all stood there for a second before I decided to run. I made it back up the stairs and didn't see them again for a long while. Periodically, as I'm driving to town or going out to dinner, I will see that same car with those same two people in it. They never do anything and haven't tried to approach me since the night at the apartment. What I would like to ask is, should I be concerned? Is this something I should be worried about? Should I take proactive measures? Why would they follow me? In 2017, my son-in-law built my daughter a house on land I'd given them, and I was his helper. One afternoon, I took a load of scrap to the landfill in the adjacent county and arrived late just before closing. The sun was going down early because it was late fall. The guy operating the landfill seemed ready to leave and wanted me to hurry. I told him I would hurry, but I asked what was up. I'd been there multiple times, but earlier in the day, and he never seemed to be so nervous. He said the funny bears came out after dark and got scraps of food from the landfill. I asked him, what's a funny bear? He said they live in the woods, and some folks call them wood boogers. I told him I knew what those were. I had my October 1980 face to face encounter with these wood boogers or Bigfoot in Cullowee, North Carolina, with one up a tree that whistled, getting my attention. The landfill is two miles west of the Okmulgee River in central Georgia. It's all woods and swamp east of the river. This is a true account, even though it is difficult for me to believe sometimes. This occurred right after I had graduated from high school in the spring of 1973. That fall, a buddy and another friend of mine came over to my place. We lived close to the University of Tennessee campus in Knoxville. We went over to get a pitcher of beer at a local watering hole. There were no girls with us to bother us or anything like that. Well, we got a pitcher of beer and then came back to my neighborhood. One of us had to relieve ourselves, so we turned into a Baptist church parking lot that I've attended a time or two. We turned up into the driveway. There were about six characters dressed in cowled red robes like a monk wears, hoods and robes all the way down to the ground. So we come around the corner of this church. My buddy was driving his beat-up old VW Beetle, freaked out, hit the reverse, made a U-turn and got out of there. We tried to get him to go back, but, of course, he wouldn't do it. The oddest thing about it was these people, whoever they were, seemed to move strangely. It almost looked like a scattershot thing, elbows raising, that sort of thing. They just kind of moved around the corner. I've wondered about that for all of these many years. I haven't got a clue. All this time, we just kind of figured it was devil worshippers. But if they were... Why in a church parking lot? I'll never know, but it sure has freaked me all these years. Ooh. 
This event happened in April of 2021. I live in Yale, Oklahoma. My wife works in Stillwater as a nurse. It was an early Saturday morning and my wife got called into work. I drove her and my 11-year-old grandson into town to drop her off. My wife was still sleepy because she was supposed to be off. She quickly nodded off by the time we made it to the highway. The sun hadn't come up yet, but it was light enough to make certain things out. Off to the right is a grassy clearing, and there are several animals around the area, but something was odd. This thing was there. It was white and acted like it was trying to hide. I slowed down a bit and saw it throw something in my direction. Whatever it was hit the ground and bounced back up. The creature took off running on two legs, then sort of morphed into running on all fours. That's the best description I have. I was curious, and we wanted to stop, but I knew my wife had to get to work. On the way back home, my grandson asked what that thing was back there. I had no idea he was awake and saw it. I told him I don't know, but we're going to go check it out. I found an area to stop right where I believe I saw it. I walked a short way and quickly found what was thrown. It was a dead turtle with the shell mostly torn off. I quickly realized if it had been a little more accurate, it could have taken out a window and caused injury or an accident. I'm always armed when I'm out, and I wanted to explore the area more, but not with my grandson. I felt danger, and I listened to my discernment. The way this thing moved was not natural, and these things are 100% nefarious. No one can tell me different. I believe I know what they are, but I've heard a few stories. To say exactly what I believe is that they are evil. There's more than what we grasp, obviously, but it is in no way, shape, or form an animal. I took my grandson back home, and my daughter was there to watch him. So I went back. Estimating the height, there's a five and a half foot fence right where I saw it. I'm six foot three and feel that whatever I saw had to be 11 or 12 feet tall. That made me a little uneasy and I'm glad I took my grandson home. I did manage to get inside the fencing and realize the ground had hidden holes. They would have seriously injured a person had they stepped into one. I have no idea how this thing managed to navigate the terrain the way it did. There were no visible tracks. We talk about it in the open. I don't see any reason not to, especially since my grandson saw it. That reaffirms in my mind that it was there. I wish I had more of a description, but it was instantly quick, insanely quick when it took off. In 2003, I was taking a trip across the country with my father from east coast to west coast. We had camped out for a couple days in federal land in Utah and needed gas. It was an extremely desolate area, but we passed a little crossroads. There was a convenience store built on the side of a rock wall. When I walked in, I remember there was an old man behind the counter and a younger looking man in one of the aisles. No flags went off, just a normal setting. I was paying for the gas at the counter, and the younger man came up behind me to stand in line. He kind of passed the boundary of my comfort zone, so I casually inched forward a bit. He did it again, so I gave him sort of a side glance, a quick glance to the eyes. Looking back at me were watery, completely jet black eyes. I only glanced at them for a split second, but that was enough to start to process what I saw. The hair on the back of my neck went up immediately. It freaked me out, but I left calmly. I got in the passenger seat of the RV. My father was done pumping gas, and we left. I didn't exactly have any feeling of fear, more just something I couldn't process from the norm. Two days later, we made it to the West Coast near San Francisco and headed north on the Pacific Coast Highway. We made it to a campground in the small coastal town of Eureka, California, to camp and stay the night. The town had a movie theater that we could walk to from camp, so we caught a show and headed back for the night. I climbed up into the loft and fell asleep. About an hour later, I woke up with a fever of 104 and very weak. I woke my father and he drove the RV to a hospital in town. In about 15 minutes, we were pulling into a parking lot. 
After waiting for a couple of minutes before going in, the fever broke. My temp dropped back to normal, but I felt worn out and drained from head to toe. I remained drained for a couple of days, but no fever. We stopped at a walk in clinic in Eugene, Oregon, to have blood work done. Nothing abnormal was found. I don't know if the sickness had any connection to the young black-eyed man I glanced at but it has always kind of haunted the back of my mind. My father was well aware of my description of the young man and was there first, hand to see this strange illness. We do still talk about that strange day 20 years ago. It was May. Two friends and I were up in the hills northwest of Yamhill, Oregon, late in the evening, around 10.30 p.m. We heard the scream. A very low, very long howl. Not a coyote, bear, or cougar. We had heard all of them before. This was nothing like anything I had ever heard. I still remember thinking to myself, how in the hell can something make such a low howl? It scared us at first but it sounded like it was far away, maybe a mile or so. We were drinking a little beer, so after a while we relaxed and forgot about it. It must have been about a half hour later when we heard it again. I swear it had to be within 30 yards of us. The same loud, low howl, but much closer, and it sounded pissed. I could feel the sound vibrations bouncing off the back of my neck. The hair stood up on the back of all our necks. All of us turned white as hell, and our jaws dropped past our knees. The howl seemed to say, get out, which is exactly what we did. I just looked at the two other guys and said, let's get the ES out to here. We did not see anything, but felt the presence. I grew up within 10 miles of that spot. I had never heard that sound before or since, except on a television show that reported a Bigfoot sighting. A guy in Idaho... Caught one on video, at least it looked like one, but when I saw the video, I heard that scream again. The guy taking the video threw the camera in the ditch and hid. It was the same scream, the only other time that I have ever heard it. It was exactly the same scream. I saw this video on a news show, something like real TV, while in Fairfax, VA, in 1992, or 1993. I do not know exactly what it is that we heard, but I know what I think it was. Bigfoot, that is my story, and I have two witnesses to back me up. My wife and I were driving back to our cabin we have in the North Woods after visiting friends in town. It was a hot, muggy summer night, but it was cooling down fast, which made it start to get foggy. The road went about a half mile through a spruce bog, then up a hill to where a farm field was on the right. Hardwoods were on the left. I was in my mid-fifties at the time and did not believe in things like what we were about to see. Out of the fog from the farm field, going from right to left, came a creature. The creature was about eight to ten feet off the ground. The best way to describe what we saw would be to say, it looked like a person who had jumped off a trampoline and took off with their arms stretched out in front of them, with their legs bent. It was upright, however, and was covered all over with fur. It was not a coyote or wolf, but looked like a cross between a man and some kind of canine. It had pointy ears and a long snout. My wife later said the head reminded her of the ancient Egyptian god with a dog head, but furry. It landed flat on its feet, directly in front of my wife's van, no more than 20 feet away. The craziest thing is it landed and jumped like a kangaroo, flying back off into the fog. Its arms were still sticking straight out in front of it. It did not act or look like any canine we know of. We had been going slowly because of the fog. As soon as she saw that thing, she stopped the van. 
We just looked at each other like, did we really just see that? However, we did see it, and it still freaks us out to this day. Another weird thing is we both felt that it was not of this world. It did not move naturally, and that was just the feeling we got. We don't tell many people about what we saw, because the people we have told don't believe or want to believe we saw what we saw. However, I did tell a good friend of mine who didn't laugh because he said, when he was a little kid, his father, who was a logger, used to tell him about loggers in the woods seeing dogmen. I'm so glad I found this website. I see that other rational people have seen similar creatures. Like some others, I was with someone witnessed it too. It must be really difficult for someone who sees one of these things by themselves to try and explain to others what they saw. In 2022, a few friends and I ventured up Quartz Creek, just outside of Merlin, Oregon, to go four, wheeling in his Jeep. It was approximately 7.30 at night, and darkness was setting in. We found ourselves on a logging road high on a ridge with an even higher ridge still above us. We stopped in an area overlooking the canyon and decided to whistle loudly over the canyon, which echoed many times before fading away. After several minutes of conversation, we were startled by a very loud whistle from the bottom of the canyon. Assuming it was someone down there messing with us, we whistled back. Again, the echo reverberated for a few seconds and then ceased. After a few minutes, the same loud whistle emanated from a different area of the canyon, more to one side than from the bottom. As darkness fell and the moon rose, the ridge line loomed above us. About twenty minutes after the initial loud whistle, a third one pierced the air, this time from the top of the ridgeline. Intriguingly, I turned to look and thought I could discern the outline of a figure approximately 200 yards away. I stared at it for about a minute, then turned to tell my buddy to look up the hill. When I redirected my gaze, the outline figure had vanished. I cannot explain all of this, and many years have passed since that night. However, I can affirm that the experience was real and truly unnerving. I haven't revisited Quartz Creek since then, but I'm open to the idea of checking it out sometime. I was out stargazing with a girl while we were talking about what we were gonna grab to eat on the way back into town, I was hit with an immediate and sudden feeling that something or someone was watching us. I looked around and didn't see anything, but the chill went through my body, but I couldn't see anything in the dark. I told the girl I was with to hop in the car, and we were gonna head into town early. Thinking back over it later that night, I realized that everything had gone silent too, not even the sound of the bugs around. In all my time in the woods hunting and fishing and camping, it's the only time I ever got that feeling, and I'm convinced that if we had stayed, something notably awful would happen. I live in a more rural part of Germany, so one night when I was riding my bike back home after I went swimming, I encountered a wolf. I got rather scared, so I just drove to a farm that I knew and waited there for my parents to come pick me up while I got a hot cocoa from the people there. I should maybe add that I was 15 at the time and knew the people at that farm because they're our closest neighbors, but still two or so kilometers away from our farm. Fifteen years old with the old man, six kilometer in on a thirteen kilometer stalk through the bush of northern Alberta, Canada, we noticed a ton of grizzly sign, fresh scat tracks and disturbed ground. Decided to cut the hunt short and cut around back to the lion we came in on. 
When we got to our old tracks, we found we were being followed by the grizzly already. About three kilometer to go, we found out it was two grizzly together. They met us at the final creek crossing, but stayed in the bush on the far side as we happily made it to our awaiting truck. It was tight butt cheeks for a bunch of the walk. My old man was stoic as shit, and I was a nervous Nelly the whole walk back. Ha ha! I want to tell you about an experience I had. It was 1980, and it was on the 1st of November. We were out coon hunting one night, and we were on the edge of a hayfield near the woods. We turned our dogs loose, and they took off. Me and my uncle were standing there, and we noticed a light in the sky moving like a triangle. It would go to one corner and be red. Go to the next corner, it would be blue. Go to the next corner, it would be white go to the next corner it would be orange we watched it for about 10 minutes and then it went to the center of this triangle i mean not a triangle i mean rectangle and this bolt came out of the sky and hit it and it split into four different pieces and took off well when the bolts came out of the sky almost like electricity went through us all the hair stood up on our arms i looked at my uncle and i said what in the world is that he was just standing there, completely stiff. His eyes were glassed over and completely black. I grabbed him and shook him, and he just fell over. When he got up, he was asking me what was going on. He remembers nothing about it. To this day, he remembers nothing. It's kind of weird, because after that happened to him, he got real, real religious. I mean, almost fanatical religious. He, to this day, says he remembers nothing about it. I don't remember it happening. And like I said, his eyes were just, they were like black orbs in his head. To hear him explain why he found religion, he thinks it was a negative experience, that God told him to get religious. Like I said, I asked him several times, what was going through your head when you were standing there before you fell over? He says, I have no idea. He says, I don't know. I don't remember seeing anything. I don't remember feeling anything. I don't remember anything about it. I think there were four of those there, and that lightning bolt or energy beam or whatever it was was refueling them. They were sitting there, making that rectangle, waiting for that refueling because as soon as it hit, like I said, it was, we felt it. I felt it, and boom, it was. There were four of them split apart, and they just, they were gone. In the blink of an eye. My mom and my aunt live out in the suburbs with not much around them except for a horse farm and some woods. My mother lives on the first floor while my aunt lives on the second floor. They've lived in that house for three years. One day my grandmother broke down crying because she claimed someone was breaking into the house, stealing her things, misplacing items, and leaving lights on. My aunt is a nurse, and dementia runs in our family, so she just assumed it was that. Regardless, my aunt installed cameras in the house to make my grandmother more comfortable, and obviously, no one was breaking into the house. However, this year, the indoor cameras caught the living room light turning on all by itself in the middle of the night. It even picked up movement and pointed itself towards the direction of the lamp. I chalked it up to faulty electricity. My aunt called an electrician. He checked everything out and said everything was fine. They ended up installing solar panels shortly after. Another time, my mom was shutting off lights and locking her doors for the night. When she woke up in the morning, the bathroom faucet was running full speed. I thought it was weird, but we just left it at that. Then, maybe five or six months ago, the knocking started. My aunt and mom were very frightened because they're a house full of women with a young child and an older woman, and it was only happening at night. They set up ring doorbell cameras and said if they heard it again, they would call the cops for obvious reasons. Not too long after they heard knocking on my mom's door, but saw no one on the camera. 
At this point, I'm thinking it's the wind shaking the door, and it's rattling the door, creating a knocking sound. This October, I went over to announce my pregnancy to my family. We were waiting on my cousin to show up. It was about 10 p.m., and we all heard a pounding on my mom's front windows. We're waiting towards the back of the house. I'm excited, so I run to answer the door, but his car is not. There, and he is not there. Looking back, my mom's two dogs did not bark nor follow me to the door, as they usually do. I love those dogs, but you could leave the room, and they will start barking. So for them not to bark or even follow me to the door was weird. My mom checks the cameras and there's no one there. Not even a notification. My aunt, who lives on the second floor, has started hearing banging on her bedroom window and her front door. My mom continues to hear banging on her window and front door. It's always three knocks. Some soft. Some hard and at different times throughout the day. Their cameras have yet to catch anything, but many family members who have come to visit have witnessed the same knocking. Some side notes, I recently found out the house used to be an ambulance service. Before any of this creepiness started happening, when I would come to visit, I would have strange lucid dreams. My mom and I have heard a pulsing noise in the middle of the night on several different nights. Recently, my aunt's co-worker said whatever it is, it's not good and out to get her three-year-old daughter. She said it was because they've been in the house for three years. She's three years old. The knocks always happen in threes. I don't know. Anyway, any thoughts as to what could cause this knocking? Skeptics are very, very welcome. Thanks. Years ago, my brother was seriously ill in the hospital. Naturally, we were all sick with worry. My aunt and uncle were asleep in bed. Then the phone rang and woke them up. My aunt Liv answered and heard her aunt Joan say, Liv, it's not his time. Then silence. Aunt Joan had been dead for at least ten years. She had a really distinctive voice, and Aunt Liv probably spoke with her daily. While Joan was alive, so I trust that she knew the voice on the phone. Aunt Live checked the phone for caller ID. Yep, 90s text. The screen was blank and didn't show up in history. My uncle witnessed the whole thing, so it wasn't a dream. And it wasn't my brother's time yet. Is this a common-ish experience? I was abducted by aliens in 1982. I was in the United States Navy at the time. I was aboard a ship, the U.S. San Bernardino, which is a tank landing ship, and its number was 1189, and this guy was aboard the ship with me. I've known him since the first day I came on board the ship, and he and I were like best of friends for four years. One night I was doing some work down in my space, because in the medical field, so I was down there catching up on some paperwork, and he came down to visit me, and he told me that he had been abducted by extraterrestrials since he was eight years old, and I took it with a grain of salt. We had a conversation about it. He caught me by surprise when he told me he was abducted, and I'd known him for four years, and this was the first time the subject ever came up. Now, this was on a Sunday night. Like I said, I took it with a grain of salt. I was like, yeah, okay, sure. Now we were out at sea. We were on a West Pacific cruise, which puts us on the other side of the world, you know, like between Japan and Korea, Singapore, Thailand, on the other side of the world. Now we weren't anywhere near California at this time. Our ship was a tank landing ship, which is designed to go right up on the beach. The front ends open up, and the Marines can drive their jeeps and their tanks and all that off into a battle scene. We had been out to sea for a week at this time. And like I said, this started on a Sunday night. Host Jimmy Church asked for his friend's name. I'll give you his last name. His name was Reach. R-E-I-C-H spells it out. Like I said, I don't know exactly where we were because we had been out to sea for a week. 
All you could see was the ocean everywhere you looked. Now, this was on a Sunday night, and like I said, I took it with a grain of salt. Now, Tuesday night, he came back down to my space because I was still doing some paperwork, you know, and he told me that his friends came and got him. I was like, oh, really, that's nice, you know, because we were still out at sea. And I said, where'd they take you, he said. They took me to your house in Kankakee, Illinois, and I was like, oh, really, what did you see? So he started describing things to me that he saw, and the more he was telling me, the more upset I was getting because I knew what he was telling me was absolutely fact. The only trouble was it wasn't fact in 1982. The first thing he was telling me about was a 1966 Ford Galaxy fire that we owned and had a, a lot of detail about it, including a chocolate milkshake stain that I had done in the back seat of the car. Well, we went to Dairy Queen, and stupid me, I spilled my milkshake all over it, and it stained the seat. And he's giving me that kind of detail. We bought the car in 1966, but we traded the car in 1973. Sometime in 1973, Church asked him if he mentioned this to him sometime at past. No, no, that's just it. And then I asked him what else he saw, and then he started describing our living room furniture that we had, which we had gotten rid of and gotten new furniture in 1968 or 60. Nine, I can't remember exactly what year. I knew the furniture that he was describing, but it was not the furniture that we owned in 1982. I was getting more and more upset. I figured the CI couldn't even have that much information on me, with that kind of detail. So I asked him, where did you get all this? And he said, I just came from your house like 15 minutes ago, and I knew that. The thing is, Jimmy... I knew what he was talking about was true, and I also knew that it wasn't today. You know, that day, the particular day that this was happening. So I asked him, how did you know this? Since he said, my friends, I said, well, if you're telling me the truth, I want to meet your little green friends. And he said, I don't know for sure if you can or not, but I'll talk to them. I'll let you know. So it was a couple of days later. He came back down in the space, and he told me, yeah, I talked to them, and they said you can meet them. And I said, you really, when? And he said, you'll find out. And so it was the next day. Well, he told me, they're here. And I said, where? He said, up on the main deck. So I go up on the main deck, and I see this star. That's the only way I can describe it to you. It was a star. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. It was shining every single color of the rainbow, all the way through it, all around it. And it was star-shaped. And I thought to myself, this could be the star of Bethlehem. I really thought that. It was beautiful. It was as bright as the sun, but it didn't hurt my eyes. Two guys were standing in front of me. They were having a conversation, and I was trying to get their attention. It was about the same altitude as a jetliner flies. You know, 30 to 35,000 feet, and it was about, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, three to three and a half miles wide, two to two and a half miles tall. You basically have to be blind not to see it. And these guys are having a conversation next to me, and I grab this one guy next to me, and I start screaming and jumping up and down and yelling. I just want this guy to see it as a witness, and I got a death grip on him, and I'm shaking him as hard as I can. And he just doesn't even respond to me. Jimmy asks how many sailors were on the ship and how many guys were on the deck. About 240. This wasn't at night. That was around 11, 30 in the morning. I just saw the two. I don't know how many that were on there, but neither one of them saw it. They never responded to me. They didn't even respond. I got a death grip on him, and I'm shaking him as hard as I can, and he doesn't even respond to me, and I guarantee you, Jimmy, you're standing in a crowd, and somebody grabs you by the shoulder and starts shaking you. You respond. 
I blink, and now I'm on their ship, and I'm looking down, and I can see my ship, and then we did a flyby, and I saw myself on the ship shaking this guy, jumping up and down, and now I don't know if they... As soon as I got on the ship, my first thought was, my God, this can't be happening. And as soon as I thought about it, a voice came into my head and said, yes, it is, Kevin. This is what you wanted. And my second thought was, as we were doing this flyby of the ship, and I saw myself. I said to myself, I'm a W-O-O. So then, as soon as I thought, I was A-W-O-O-L. A second voice came into my head and said, They don't even know you're gone. That's exactly what they said. And then it just went from there. He goes on to say about how he actually wrote the entire event down, about 30 pages describing each detail and sent it to George Norrie back in 2010. They took me to the future and they took me to the past and everything was telepathically. They told me that some of what you see is yet to be. Some of what you see has already happened. And they took me back to Kankakee. I saw myself walking out of my house talking to my grandmother who died in 1972. And then at the end of it, it was 20 or 25 minutes, they were showing me different things. They were showing me Armageddon type things. Things that I didn't want to know. Things that I don't even want to know. Church asks, what year was this? I have no idea. They didn't tell me what year they were taking me. The last thing I saw was that I was riding a motorcycle, and I got hit broadside by a car, and I was lying next to the bike. Now everything they showed me only lasted about seven to ten seconds. Just enough time for me to realize what I was looking at, and now I'm looking at something different. And this lasted about a half an hour. And then, the very last thing they showed me was a motorcycle accident, and I'm laying next to it, and I'm not moving or anything, and I thought they showed me how I'm going to die. And that motorcycle accident happened on my 2003 Harley-Davidson, and for 15 days I was knocked out. Of course, I didn't know I was knocked out when I saw it. I thought I had died. So for 21 years, I thought I knew how I was going to die. Church asks him to describe the ship, the beings, etc. The first thing I saw when I got on board everywhere I saw was light, light screens. I could see the things that they were showing me and stuff like I was looking through a window. It didn't matter, like in my peripheral vision. All I could see was solid and it was white on the inside of the wall. But if I turned my head, I was looking right out through that area. See, but in my peripheral vision, it was solid. And when this all ended, I realized that I was standing down a metal grate. You know, like a fire escape grate. And it was gray, like battleship gray. And I was standing above another level. And I was with them for about 40 minutes before I finally got to look at them. Church asks how long he was with them for. For about 45 minutes to an hour. I mean, you know... I thought I could handle it, and when I was with them, I asked them, Are you gonna eat me? And they told me, You watch too many horror movies. Which really isn't true, because I haven't seen that many. I didn't ask them to define that. That was their response when I asked them if they were gonna eat me. They said, No, you watch too many horror movies. And then I asked them what they looked like, and they said, We're not little, and we're not green. And you want to talk about an understatement, when I finally got the courage up to turn around and look at them, they were 12 to 15 feet tall. Church asked what happened when he got back. When I came back, I was lying on my rack. I sit up in my bed and something is off. My uniform, my dungaree uniform, was just soaked to the skin with sweat. And I was hyperventilating. And I thought, oh God, this has just been a dream. And then I turned to get out of my rack, and my friend was standing there. He's got this ear, to ear grin, and he goes, mocking up a sinister-sounding voice. Tell me about your ride, Kevin. I never talked to him after that. I avoided him like the plague. I thought he was one of them.
It all started on one random day when I was 14. I picked up a call from an unknown number. Hello? I was met with some silence, and then a feminine voice spoke. Is this? It's a name similar to mine. By similar, I mean the similarities between Leela and Lily. Similar names. I responded, Are you sure you want a variation of my name? She giggled, and no matter what I asked or said, all she did was laugh, thinking it was a prank. I hung up. However, she called again and again, to the point where I eventually blocked her. Normally, I could see the number of times a blocked number called me as missed calls. In the span of 30 minutes to an hour, she called me 60 times. Every single day, I had over 100 missed calls from her. No matter how many times I blocked her, she would call from a different number, and all she did was laugh and breathe into the phone. I even had other people pick up, and some screamed at her to leave me alone. But all she did was laugh. For a whole year, I was terrorized by her phone calls and her never-ending laughter. Why not change phone numbers, right? My number was given to me by my dad during the divorce, and at that time I barely ever saw him. I treasured the number he gave me and refused to give it up because of that girl. I was in Los Angeles at my mom's house while my friend was visiting our other friend who had just moved to Roswell, New Mexico. All of a sudden, I got a text from Lee. She was very frightened and wanted to know if there were such things as aliens for real. She felt that something was going to happen to her. She texted me everything that was happening to her as it happened, and I could tell by the way she was typing her words that she was terrified and scared for her life. I became very frightened myself as I read her texts. I kept telling her to call me, but she wouldn't. She just continued texting, and finally she said she didn't want to call because they would hear her. Anyway, this is the story she told me about what happened to her that night. She was coming back from a late-night call in Hobbs, like 2 a.m., and she still had several miles to go to reach the house, where she was staying in Roswell. She said she saw a light in the sky zoom past her from the front. Then suddenly she became aware of very bright lights behind her car that seemingly came out of nowhere but were following her car in very close proximity and resembled the headlights of a car, except that there was no car visibly attached to them. It was as if the lights themselves were floating and following her. When she would speed up, they would speed up very close to her car. When she would slow down, they would slow down even more to the point where they were no longer close to her car anymore. But they would stall way further behind so that she could still not get a good look at the vehicle behind the lights. Then she would speed up to 100 miles per hour at one point because she was trying to see how far they would go to keep up with her. And they were almost glued to her bumper at that point. They had no problem staying right along with her at that speed, and yet they would not pass her. While she was driving very fast, trying to shake the lights, the inside of her car filled up with a noise that she could not quite put into words. She said it seemed to be coming from her purse beside her, and it was a loud and terrifying sound, unlike anything she ever heard before, and she felt at that moment that they were trying to make her crash. She started noticing all the skid marks on the road that were going off the road in the same direction and how many there were. One after the other, like almost 30 sets of skid marks, all within a one-mile stretch of road that she felt was designated for that purpose. And she felt that it was intended for her to do the same. She got the idea that they were amused by her fear and that they could read her mind. And that's why she was afraid to call me, because she felt they would hear her. Almost as fast as the lights appeared, they disappeared, and she resumed her driving normally till she reached her friend's house. She was so scared she couldn't even get out of the car. Our friend had to come get her. She got very, very ill the next day. She couldn't get out of bed. She was terribly sick for two days. Before the incident occurred, she was not one to really care too much, one way or the other, about other life forms, and she bordered on disbelief in anything she had not seen with her own eyes.
She now has a firm belief in alien life forms, and she also believes that they were trying to run her off the road that night and that they had run several people off the road before, evidenced by the many skid marks that were veering off the road in the same direction in that one little mile stretch of highway. The other strange thing that happened was that when we were both discussing it a few days later, we wanted to retrace the route that she took that night to try to determine where it had happened exactly in her latitude history for that little stretch of time was missing. We looked at all the records of the text that we sent back and forth both on her phone and on mine. We both have Google Voice and it saves every text and phone call. Yet there was no trace of any of the text on either end. It was very strange. Then two weeks after this happened, my daughter came to visit me in California. She had done a movie shootout in Roswell, and she told me this story. She was shooting a movie about aliens, and she wanted it on location in Roswell, so she brought her equipment and crew members out to Roswell. They shot the scenes and ended up having to spend the night out there. So she went to the redacted the hotel name and paid for several rooms for herself and her crew members for the night. Upon going to bed, she discovered, as did the rest of her crew members in each of their own rooms, that the bed mattresses and box springs were covered with massive blood stains, and there was not a mattress or box spring in the whole hotel that did not have blood stains on it, for which they would not even offer an explanation. Why would the whole hotel be filled with mattresses covered with blood? Very scary, needless to say. They left and will not be returning. When I was a teenager, one of my best friend's girlfriends called my parents home looking for her boyfriend, my best friend. She reached my younger brother. When I got home from work, my brother gave me the sketchy details of her call. She claimed at the time of the call, two policemen paid her a visit. My brother and a group of concerned friends were going over to her house to talk in person. I opted out, being tired from working a double shift. They left, and I hit the sack. As I started to drift off, I heard my side door slam open followed by the sound of someone falling or frantically shuffling down my basement stairs. That's where my room was. My room was the first door right across from the basement stairs, right as you entered the side door of my parents' house. I didn't get out of bed, but I called out to whomever was out there. I figured it was my brother coming back. Maybe he forgot something and he was running back into his room to get it, which was the second door to my room. Whoever it was never came into my room. They ran right past and went into his bedroom. It was so clear. I even heard panting. Then I thought maybe it was my best friend. He would do that whenever he got into trouble or whatever. He wouldn't go home. He would always come straight to my parents' house. After getting no reply, I got up, looked around, shut the side door, went back downstairs, and looked around in my brother's room. I didn't see anyone. About 20 to 30 minutes after that, my brother called me very upset, but by then I already knew my friend was dead. In fact, I told my brother before he could finish his sentence. They found him in his girlfriend's car with a bullet hole in the center of his head and one through the palm of his hand, as though he tried to block the bullet. His murder has never been solved. The strange part the next morning, the police claimed they hadn't been to the home of the deceased's fiance. They contacted the immediate family late that night. Going by the police report and what his older brother told us in a very accusing manner, forgive my digression, but remember that scene in the movie Fire in the Sky where Travis's older brother questioned Michael about Travis's whereabouts. It was eerily similar to that. Just take it up a few notches. The times didn't match up whatsoever. At the time, my brother received the call from her taking in the eyewitness. He hit a fire hydrant on the witness's front lawn, but he never saw anyone around the car or scene. Account, his murder hadn't taken place. True story. 
Glad there is a forum to get this off my chest. Summer of 2013, I'm driving a packed a haul through a remote section of Navajo County with my 28-year-old daughter following in her car. Middle of the night, pitch black, and the only radio station I could get was KTNN, the Navajo Nation. The DJ had been playing old school country, but switched it up, and suddenly the cab of the truck was filled with the other, worldly sounds of the Bear Creek singers. We had just passed the turnoff to the ghost town of Zenith. Nobody lives out there. It's just devoid of life. All I could see was the road illuminated by the headlights and that insane music filling my mind. We're doing about 70, and suddenly he was right in front of me. The next couple seconds goes like this. There, illuminated in the headlights, is a figure on all fours walking across the highway directly in front of my speeding truck. In place of arms and legs, this creature had four long sticks, and the body was draped in a colorful Navajo-style blanket. No head, just those sticks moving back and forth, slowly propelling him across the road in the middle of the night. I swerved the truck and just missed him. Looked in the rear views and saw him in my approaching daughter's headlights. Then watched her car make the same last, second maneuver to avoid running him over. I was stunned and just kept driving, reassured that she was still behind me. Thirty minutes later, we pulled up to her new digs in Snowflake, Arizona, and her first words to me were what the fifth was that. For the record, she is LDS and almost never swears. Since that night, I myself have moved to Snowflake and driven that same lonely stretch of the 277 fairly often at night, but never while listening to KTNN for fear of creating conditions that would result in a repeat of the incident. I inquired with my native friends up here, and the only advice was don't tell that story anymore. So I still think God, superstitions, and everything else is BS, but will go to my grave believing native culture holds powerful secrets. The rest of us don't understand. Skinwalkers are real, and apparently they like to mess with ignorant whites like me. Appreciate any feedback because, like I mentioned, our native friends won't discuss it with us, and nobody believes me except my kid. Oh, and I'm now a big fan of native drum ceremonies songs and music so something good did come out of this experience. Two weeks ago, me and a group of buddies were having a bonfire out in Kuna, Idaho. I was feeling down that night, so I decided to unload my dirt bike and take a little night ride on some trails. I went alone and rode for probably three miles from the fire up on a hill. I sat up there for probably 45 minutes, and I was 100% alone up there. There was nobody around. From time to time, I would hear small laughter really close by. It sounded like two, three people. It wasn't constant. I would hear it every five minutes, and it kept getting closer. I had that funny feeling that I wasn't alone after all. So I went to go start my bike, and of course it didn't want to start. I was able to bump start it, going down the hill, and it did not want to stay running. I don't think it sat long enough for the engine temp to drop all the way back down. I had to keep revving it to keep it running, trying to head back to the fire. The whole time I was really scared for no reason. I couldn't convince myself to go faster than five miles per hour, which was strange because I always haul ass. I have a light bar mounted on my bike so I was able to see just fine. At first riding back I thought I seen shadow figures in the corner of my eyes, but they would disappear. I made it back safe and nothing else happened, but I knew there was something out there that night. I didn't think much of it until I heard my buddies talking about skinwalker stories in that same area. People tell me I got extremely lucky that night. I don't know what to believe. Who knows what was out there with me that night. The laughter of my bike not wanting to run. The feeling I had. And the shadow figures are all things in common I saw from other stories. It was a strange night. If anyone on here is from Kuna, Idaho, and knows anything about skinwalker encounters out there, 
feel free to reach out. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.